indeed to thank you for the um, for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak to you and especially I want to thank the organizer for the special attention especially uh, Sue and um, um, Ryan for the special attention to the speaker which made me as a first time uh, UDL IRN uh, conference at ND made me feel very much at home and it also made the conference more accessible for me so thank you for that um, is it on yeah but this is not, uh, one second. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about today, I'm gonna very briefly talk about accessibility. Um, ask the question, is UDL really for all? Just a question for all of us to think about. Um, briefly uh, review language simplification and then take most of my time to talk about simultaneous simplification, which is what I am um, currently excited about and would like to share with you. So when we talk about accessibility, we really talk about the extent to which system facilities or services can be used by as many uh, people as possible without special accommodation. Now there are a lot of different definitions of accessibility out there, but I chose this one because I think this, this is the one that ties the best with the core uh, UDL um, principles. So I would like to invite you to think about is this talk right now accessible for all and in particular is it accessible for a person with an intellectual disability but before you talk you you do that I would like you to imagine that rather than being here in thousand in this um, beautiful um, hall um, you are currently at a UDL conference in Japan and all the talks are provided in Japanese um, I would assume that you would expect uh, to have a very uh, simple accommodation, uh, which is simultaneous uh, interpretation. Uh, specialized real-time translation, um, accurate and complete oral translation at the same rate of speech as the speaker is speaking uh, with minimal lag time. Because this is what we expect if we go from language um, to language. But um, can people with intellectual disabilities or cognitive disabilities expect the same at our conferences? Now, uh, that's a good question. This is a quote that's been with me uh, since 95. It's from a research by Quibble. What it says is if you come from an ethnic group and you're not supplied with the information in a language that you understand, um, then it's obvious discrimination. But because you have a disability and you speak English, then how do you prove it's discrimination? Now I think here I do not need to prove that it's discrimination. It's very obvious to all of us that it's discrimination. But what do we do about it? And do we do anything about it really? And that brings me to the question, is UDL really for all? I mean, I think we all think about it, UDL as a framework that provides all students with uh, equal opportunities to learn, that expect all teachers to design flexible curricula to meet the needs of all learners. But who are these all learners that we're talking about? Um, I think it's pretty safe to say that when we're talking about people with uh, learners with learning disabilities, they're included. I mean, uh, I think UDL, to a large extent, is geared towards people with learning disabilities. What happened with cognitive disabilities? There we get into some question. When I talk about cognitive disabilities, um, talking about uh, people with learning disabilities, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, some mental health issues, uh, autism spectrum, and other people like that, to what extent is UDL really um, applied to all of them? And then I think the question becomes even larger when we talk about people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Usually what we then get is the question of, but wait a minute, do we need to lower our standards? What about our educational rigor? What happens with that? That's what we usually run into when we talk about people with uh, learners with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. So where does the language simplification that I talked about before, which is one of the accommodations that um, are required for people with uh, uh, intellectual disabilities, where does it tie into UDL? 
uh, or how can we use plain language in, use, in UDL? Some of it I think we're doing anyway. Um, I think in a lot of our representation, especially when we have uh, pre-prepared uh, material and handouts and things like that, we usually take it into account and we tend to have something in the form of plain language. Um, but what about our presentation? What about our classes? What about our conferences or our talks? To what extent do we uh, apply plain language there? And then if we do not do that, how, what can we expect in terms of engagement and in terms of action and expression? I've been to a conference before where uh, there was accommodation for people with intellectual disabilities, but that was after the talk. So they were expected to sit there for 20 minutes or half an hour, not really f being able to follow what's going on. And afterwards, there'll be a brief um, kind of uh, plain language explanation. Does that really help with engagement? And does that really enable them to uh, get into action and expression? I'm not sure about that. So what can we do about it? How can we apply language simplification? When we talk about language simplification, we talk about the pr processing and editing information to make it clear. I think that's good for all of us. To make it simple. There we get again into the question of the standards and the rigor and what do we do about our um, highly motivated students and our gifted students. And that is where we get into the most problem. It has to be readily understood by people with cognitive disabilities. Um, and who, which are the people that language simplification is good for? I know in UDL now we're talking not just about students, we're talking about learners. So we're talking about uh, learners with um, cognitive disabilities, with intellectual disabilities, learning disabilities, autism spectrum, some psychiatric disabilities, older adults, oftentimes people with dementia. Um, and you know what? Um, English is a second language, uh, learners. And in a way, all of us, when we're tired, when we're a little stressed, think about how much easier it is when we get something very clear and simple. We don't have to struggle with it. So really, the, the doing of language simplification has many rules, but I just picked up a few. And I want you to remember them, because I'm going to ask you to use them in a second. Um, we're going to use short sentences. We're going to use active verbs, which we found is much more um, um, easier to grasp with than passive words. We're going to minimize our acronyms and uh, abbreviation, as well as our jargon and idioms. And when we present material in a visual way, we're also going to be wanting to use um, pictograms. In fact, the pictograms that you have right here is the European pictogram for language simplification. I don't know if any of you had come across it. So what we really want to do is create clear and uh, concise content. And here I have a quote from one of my research, one of the first uh, research uh, experience I did in this area. And this is from a mother who told me, you know, sometimes it is really frustrating. All you need to do is rephrase. Use three words instead of 20. But it is not easy. How do you find the correct words? Um, so that is one of my, our main challenges. How do you find the correct words? And so now I want to try and think, with the help of all of you, of how can we make this talk, or any lecture for that matter, more accessible for someone with a cognitive disability. And to do that, what I would like to ask you to do just for a minute is to pair up, kind of uh, be in pairs, and decide which of you is going to be the simplifier. And then as I go to my next slide, I'm going to ask the one who's the simplifier to try, while I'm talking, to um, uh, get the message across to the person that you are simplifying for in all the, those rules that I talked about before, short sentences, uh, simple words, etc. cetera. Um, are you ready for the simplification challenge? OK. Just for a minute. It's going to be very, very brief, I promise. OK. So. What we see in this slide uh, ahead of you, one second, uh, one second. Okay, 
what we see in the slide ahead of you is the um, correlation between fertility rate and life expectancy over uh, quite a few years in many different countries over the world. As we can see here, the Sub-Sahara Africa, we have a much closer correlation. It hasn't changed that much over the years as opposed to East Asia and the Pacific where there's been a very big change with a very high life expectancy going with a very low fertility rate. You got it? <laughs> okay, so how many of you managed to say something like, well, there are um, different countries around the world. In some of them, people live longer. And in the countries where people live longer, they also tend to have less children in the family. Okay, that's all I said, basically, really. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, if I can have your attention back, really what we're saying is that we, if we take the knowledge base, okay, and the know-how, the skills of simultaneous interpretation, real-time, on-the-go translation, and the know-how and skills of language simplification, then what we get is simultaneous simplification, which is what you were trying to do right now, which is really what we're talking about is the real-time translation into plain language. Um, and I believe this is part of our uh, upcoming challenge. So I was um, really kind of playing with this idea for uh, quite a few years now. And then um, to my uh, uh, not surprised, but I was very happy that one of the main service providers in Israel who was running an international uh, conference uh, just this uh, uh, last summer um, so said, you know what, maybe we should give it a try. But uh, if you want to give it a try, you want, we want you to show us that it can actually work. So we did a little, uh, so first of all, what I did, I did a literature review. That's what I do. I'm a researcher. I'm an academics. That's what I do. So I looked through uh, research. I looked through legislation. I looked through standards and regulation. I looked through advocacy uh, websites. And I found many different uh, types of accommodations for people with cognitive disabilities in conferences and learning. But I didn't really find anything about what I'm talking about right now, about uh, language simplifi uh, simultaneous simplification. So we did a little pilot. Just before the conference, we invited 20 people with intellectual disabilities to the conference venue. And we uh, had two presenters come and give their talk. Now, uh, we were in Israel, apparently. Uh, we're talking about 20 people with cognitive disabilities, intellectual disabilities, Hebrew speaker. None of them had any English. The talks were professional talks in English, talks that were going to be at the, that international conference. Um, and in between, we wanted to see if it's really actually working. So we did some focus groups trying to ask people um, how, how it was, see if, if it really worked. And I think the thing that really got me was that after the first talk, which was a 20 uh, minute uh, professional talk in English, uh, one of my colleagues went up there and she asked the people, so how was it? Now, what she was trying to ask, how did you work with the earphones? Could you hear okay? Was it, um, did you understand what they were saying? And what the people responded to was the content of the talk. They started commenting about, did we agree, did we disagree with what the, the person was saying, the, the um, lecturer. Now, again, I remind you, it's a lecture in English, professional lecture. We're talking about people with intellectual disabilities who do not speak English. So we figured, well, I guess that it works. And one of the participants said something that, for me, really hit it home. She said, I listened to a talk in English, and I understood it in Hebrew. And that's all we were looking for, really. So um, uh, obviously, as I said, OK, it looks like it's, uh, it's a go. And we, since then, we did it in two conferences. One was that international conference. Um, and uh, so it seemed, one second, I flipped it a little bit. So we saw that it's doable. And we also saw that it was worthwhile because it really enabled people with intellectual disabilities to take part in a real way. 
Um, and now we were trying to see what's the best practice. And that, that's when we got into those two conferences, the stage two uh, of the pilot study. Um, and we did in-depth interviews with both self-advocates, consumers that were at the conferences, and um, uh, staff members and professionals that were there to see if it actually had worked, not just on a very small scale of a 20-minute uh, talk, but a whole day conference. This is a slide from the first uh, conference. It was an international conference, about 800 attendees. And you may not be able to see, but in the crowd, we have some people with intellectual disabilities wearing those earphones, listening to a very complex talk about future technology. Um, and in fact, this talk was supposed to be in English, but it turned out to be in Hebrew. We just found out as the speaker started talking that he was talking in Hebrew rather than English. And so we had to translate to do the simultaneous simplification from professional Hebrew into plain Hebrew. Um, and that rose some other questions. But when we went to the people, and some of them we got to two, three weeks after, they still remembered some things from the talk. They really got it. And even more so, as the speaker was um, talking, he asked the question, he asked the audience something. And the great thing was that uh, among the first ones to raise their hand and answer, and answer to the point where some of uh, our people were sitting there with the earphones getting the simultaneous simplification. So it really enabled them to take part in what was going on in that international conference. So I want to share with you just uh, preliminary best practice ideas that we got from that. Uh, as I said, it's really very, uh, just at the beginning. So first of all, it has to be real time. But what we do in real time, we do content editing, we do interpreting, because as opposed to simultaneous uh, interpretation, where you are obliged to give every word that is going um, exactly the way that it is said, here we have to do the content editing and the interpretation. Otherwise, it's not going to work. That's the main thing. And then we, of course, have to translate it into plain language. Now, some other things that we learn is that the intonation is really important. Um, what people, first of all, it has to be age appropriate. That, but that goes, I think, without saying, definitely in this uh, uh, audience. But it also, what uh, some of the people were saying is that because things were said uh, calmly and slowly and in a nice voice, they were responding to that. They said it made them calmer. They're there in this big, huge uh, audience, and it made them feel calmer when they heard it. So that's part of the things we have to talk about, and there's some preparation going uh, into it, both on part of the simplifier and on the for the um, uh, for the audience. So to conclude, what I would like to say is, first of all, the simplifying isn't uh, simple, but um, it can be done, no doubt. It is inclusive and respectful, and it requires expertise. But if you decide that this is something you would like to do, it is definitely doable, and you can learn how to do it, and you can do it, and by that, provide the cognitive ramp for people with cognitive disabilities to take part in um, all the things and the beautiful learning that we are doing. So thank you.